What brings me to this um, stage is that I've been using data analysis tools, um, the, the big three, SQL, Python, uh, since last millennia. And um, since then, I've talked to an awful lot of people about what they're trying to do with their data. Um, yeah, I know people whose job titles are data scientists. I know data um, analytics people. I know academics. And I know programmers. And one of the things with programmers who want to do more stuff with data, I have to say, is there's a bit of a nervousness about approaching this area where you know there's a body of knowledge, but you're not really sure what to do. So I want to talk through a bit about thinking in data. And I will freely admit the theme for this is based very strongly on the Marguerite painting um, treachery of image, better known as the this is not a pipe picture. Because, is it a pipe? To get an answer out of that depends on very much on what the nature of pipeness is you're after. Is it a pipe for blowing bubbles? No, um, Lego won't work for that. Is it um, something to inspire the idea of pipiness in the mind? Yes, absolutely. So there's going to be an awful lot of it depends on why you're doing it in the course of this. And a lot of people tend to think of data science as being a thing of mathematical complexity. That's a bit of a red hearing, and I will be admit I'm being opinionated here. But we used to predict things with astrology, and astrology has got some extremely complicated equations in it. Now, when we want to find out about what fortune holds, we hear from economists and pundits. By the way, if you're ever feeling a bit annoyed about the pundits you're hearing in the run-up to the you know, changes in GDP being announced, just keep in mind that New Zealand releases its economic data quarterly. Its trading partners release economic data monthly. If you want a pretty good idea of what the result's going to be three weeks out, have a look at what's happening with all our trading partners. Does that matter? Is this a pipe? Well, it depends on very much if the economic figure is one that is heavily influenced by New Zealand or by international trade. And I have to say, the pundits you hear from in the media tend to be ones talking about New Zealand conditions all the time. So there's a tension there. But where we're actually going for talking through some longer examples is back in history to 1896. This is an 1896 electoral roll from South Dunedin. And the reason I picked it as an example is when you're dealing with 127-year-old material, there's no confidentiality in the data about people that you face with modern data. So we've got surnames, we've got first names, we've got street names, and we've got occupations. And row after rows of that. So what is that as data? It's text. And we could treat that in a chat GTP corpus kind of way. We could feed it in and look at the adjacent entries and we could build something that generates fictitious but plausible seeming entries. That would be a way of treating that data. Does it make sense? Well, not if you want to find out anything true about the occurrences at the time, but it does make sense from a this is something you can do with text kind of way. What would more commonly be done with this kind of data is to structure it in some fashion. And you might notice there's a few commas there. So this is also comma-separated values data in its raw form. 
And commonest practice would be column of surnames, column of first names, column of street, and a column of occupation. That's pretty typical analytics. No numbers in there, but you might generate numbers about number of occupations just by counting people up, by doing a how many of each sort of analysis which makes sense if that's a question you're interested in. And it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And the electoral roll is possibly the most complete source of that information that you could get your hands on. But, and this is a problem you face any time you dip into data, is it representative of the case that you are trying to describe? Is the electoral role representative of the general population? No. No one under 18 on the electoral role. And in fact, in 1896, there was still a bit of tension over suffrage. So um, number of women on it carries a bit. And quite frankly, Maori Chinese uh, weren't encouraged to be on the electoral role. Let's put it that way. But you can do absolutely useful descriptive stuff about the source. Is it the pipe that we are talking about? Depends on the question you're trying to answer. But 1896 wasn't the only election. There's one in 1881 every three years. So a perfectly normal, reasonable, analytical thing to do is to take the two data sets and join them together in a classic relational data kind of manner, probably with as many fields as you can successfully match together. And you get the ability to look at change over time. You're comparing two things. Quite frankly, most business reporting is, is number going up or is number going down from change over time. But you've actually just changed the nature of the underlying data as well. Because you're suddenly only working with the people present in both data sets. Does that matter for your answer? Depends on what you're trying to achieve. And you might be unsatisfied with the number of matches you make because people change their jobs and people move. So you start doing fancier things, like using a scripting language like Python to run sequential join tests on the data, test joining the most likely and then trying steadily more outlandish joins with more limited data. It's a useful technique. You might try something really sneaky and observe people as actual people live in households. So, households shift together. What you are technically doing at a data analysis level is you are aggregating the data into broader units, going up one step in aggregation and then coming back down somewhere else. Slightly fancy. That's at about the point that your colleagues may begin to say, David should never work on contemporary data, it's too dangerous. Um, if your name happens to be David. But the key thing here really is the more data sets you're joining together, you're getting better and better pictures of a smaller and smaller group, and you are building structural biases into it that depend on the nature of the data collected. And very often with data analysis, you're using someone else's data. And the solution there is understanding where those biases came from. Possibly the most important three letters in New Zealand per, per capita, things like that. And so much of numbers are actually a rate of some sort. Rates over time or 
per capita or other forms of rates. And the what you are purring can be very important for what you think it's telling you. We've got New Zealand road fatalities and where we fit in the world. We're so-so for the road fatalities for the number of people. We're not too bad for the number of fatalities for the number of motor vehicles. Does that just mean we have too many motor vehicles? We're pretty poor for the number of kilometres driven, which is actually probably the best measure to use. However, there are only 25 countries that actually um, can track the number of kilometres driven. And that kind of thing changes the sort of answer that we're getting. Again, none of this is a reason not to do the work, not to look at these sort of questions. What this is, is a reason to document your thinking and to explain the best thinking I could do at the time was this. And on that per, here's something I did a few years ago. Um, I have to give a shout out to Chris Knox, um, who's a data person at the New Zealand Herald here. He made an OIA of what is the hour that every road accident occurred in. And this is the number of accidents by day as a weekly pattern, a per day, and there's a cycle, weekly cycle here. And if you're investigating that, you might think other PERS might be relevant. Like PER, what was happening on Monday at different hours of the evening commute? Highlight something different, different slice of PER. Um, the key evening commutes, the after 6pm, are the green and the almost impossible to see yellow that is very close to the green line up there. But you might be wondering, well, perhaps the tra number of traffic is different. So you might per the Auckland Harbour Bridge, how many cars were going over the Auckland Harbour Bridge on that day, on the Monday. Get a very similar pattern. You might per the total daily crashes, how many were going on in the evening commute. Each one is telling you a slightly different thing. There is nothing wrong with any of these different ways. They're just different facets of trying to get to reality. And the, my personal favourite is the evening crashes per the morning crashes. I personally, and this is just personal opinion, think that there's a story about weekday fatigue going on in there. I have done a lot of stuff with COVID data um, over the past few years, and there was a, another story I'd just like you to think about. Um, back in August 14th, we um, dropped isolation, we dropped masking and care, and people were really interested in what effect that was going to have on the COVID numbers. This is a per August 14th by age group per August 14th because that made sense to me at the time as a way of really seeing what was going on. And people were really interested in what was happening with the old group, the people in Kia, immediately after dropping this masking requirement in Kia and things like that. And there are actually two ways of looking, main ways of looking at data over time. There's what you might think of as the traditional anomaly detection um, that you see a lot when analysing computer data of we assume things are going along and we're looking for a variation of the normal pat from the normal pattern. It ex something exceeds the bounds. And for the 90-year-olds, it could be varying and coming back. This is on the 19th of August, by the way. But the other way of looking at it is that 
stuff happened on the 14th for which we have reasons to believe there could be a change. And so we're looking for is, and in fact, at what point is there a detectable change in the line? And there was quite a lot of discussion went on around that. In fact, Ashley Bloomfield came back onto Twitter to um, discuss that. So neither way of looking at the data is right or wrong in itself. What's important is documenting the thinking. And if you are wondering what happened, that's what happened and is continuing to happen. Um, from working a lot with COVID data, I'd say if people weren't testing themselves in an, in an event like this, it'd be about a 20% chance that there'd be an infectious person in the room. And then it comes down to masking and ventilation. So with all of that, the prescription for getting more comfortable with doing it is all I was doing with all of those analyses was basic adding up. I was adding up by groups. I was um, adding up at different points along time. Nothing fancy in that. No elaborate statistical tests. The elaborate statistical tests tend to come in when you are trying to work out what is an appropriate range for something. When is something likely to happen? By how much either side? That's when those kind of maths are really important. But if you are wanting to get comfortable working with data, that's a perfectly reasonable level to be diving in at. But understanding something about the data so you understand what can I do with these building blocks is perhaps one of the key points. What is it useful for? Is it a, is it a valid Lego piece for a pipe or not? And the great thing about doing data analysis in, in scripting languages, whether it is Python or R or whatever, is that you can explain as part of the analysis what your thinking was. And it doesn't matter if you don't get it perfectly right the first. Because documenting it in a script means you can improve over time. You can go back and look at something you did years ago and go, well, let's, let's try this slightly different way. And that's my kind of opinionated take on from the data world the bigger blocks that that I see with program people from a programming background getting started with data and in my opinion what nated way if you want to put me on the spot now and ask questions that I know I may even say something I regret We do have several minutes for questions if anyone wants to. What's a question you're hoping someone will ask? Um, does anyone want to know why there are 30% more earthquakes detected at night? <laughs> Actually, I see there's a genuine question. I wonder if you could go there is the practice what we say in the petite. Well, this can, is sorry, David. Can you, David? Can you repeat the question? Um, the going a bit more into the the crashes by wing day and the fatigue. What is clear in the data is that there are more crashes going on as you go through the week. Monday is kind of off, out of line. Um, there's a possible argument about people are just not keen on Monday morning, and it has more crashes and that throws the evening off. Um, it might not be fatigue. Fatigue is, a, is something that can't be ruled out from that. And that's one of the things with analysis is you're often not making a positive call. You're going, I tried really hard and I couldn't come up with 
you know, anything that got rid of this is a possible answer. The, the classic null hypothesis approach. Um, but it, just a few months ago, I had someone replicate that New Zealand analysis with Australian data, and they did find exactly the same thing. So whatever is going on with crashes that causes them to escalate in the evenings during commute time through the week, and these are injury and death crashes, by the way, um, is going on certainly in both Australia and New Zealand. And I have had someone say, hey, I really am cautious on my driving on Friday. So I could quit quite slow of that. So then. I was there. Oh, yeah, over here. Well, problems that fall to see people falling it through with the fact that it actually displayed the core process that was wrong. The, the commonest pitfall mm. is being convinced that the thing you think should be the case is the case. Um, that I am, that one thing is the entire explanation for all the ills in the world, and, and this is evidence of that, because the world is a horrible, unstructured, messy place, and we are structuring it and creating facets to look at that. And those facets, yeah, they illuminate things, but it's still a messy world in the hive it all. Um, so people being too convinced that, and as a result of that, their theories about how the world should work, leading their conclusions to a level not supported by the data. You can go a long way just for making things clearer, just by showing people what the data summaries are without imposing any great meaning on it. So you, you last had the, the basic candidates to the input and then someone else. Yeah, completely unrelated data set that happened to have um, date and time of accidents for Australia. They applied the same methods. By scenes, as you know, that's the best. Yes. Um... I am going to say I would have to check the per watts on that because the, the kilometres driven and things like that and that they're different driving environments. So, so yes, absolutely, we do have more per people from memory. Uh, um, yeah, that's the part to do really get down to the middle of that idea and then when we crash it and you can get it up if if you were um the question was are some data sets too incomplete to get a full picture short answer is i'm going to go right back to that first si slide and say depends on on what you are trying to conclude so road conditions are in fact in the public data for New Zealand crashes that you can get. Um, but road conditions, weather doesn't change notably between weekdays. So, so road conditions is something you can rule out because there is a change um, across the weekdays. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, Okay, um, hang on, hang on. Can we, Chris, did you have a shorter question before he goes into earthquakes? Okay. 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 The, the, this has been my, um, bit of noir for, for, for years. Um, originally I was annoyed by something, so I wanted to, to, a data set, cherry pick it deliberately and produce a bad result to explain 
bad cherry picked data. So I downloaded all the earthquakes for New Zealand and I made a graph of the hour of the day and there were 30% more at night, which was a bit disturbing because I hadn't cherry picked the data at that point. Um, and there is, this is where I have to say, I'm going to say right at the outset, I've had vigorous discussion with any number of geologists <laughs> on this. Um, there is an actual variation in the data on the seismograph hence themselves in the distribution of the strength of the amplitude of the, the wobbliness of the needle. Um, so it's not a later artifact. I think there is an extremely interesting correlation between, um, uh, in fact, the sun's gravity and the subduction zone off the North Island. Um, which is kind of pulling the North Island down and the direction of the sun and things like that. But that's just my interpretation on that. The 30% the most people don't disagree with, particularly when I've seen the data. Um, just the explanation is still in a debate. Um, the, however, I would add this is not damaging earthquakes and in most cases this is not feelable earthquakes. This is just little settling <laughs> earthquakes, as it were. Um, so that that one, yes, you don't always find nice clean answers to things, and sometimes you spend years discussing it with people. Um, yeah, the, California's actually the other way round. Um, however, the Nevada subduction area does this thing. Um, the, and there are a few, yeah, it's essentially worldwide it does seem to be a thing that particularly the, the subduction area sort of off Greece and the Mediterranean is quite dramatic. But as I said, this, the reason for it occurring is still very much up to debate. There is, I've had, I've had incredible ongoing arguments about trying to disprove the idea that it's more human noise during the day, creating a masking effect on the size of the breath. And that can involve things like when we were in lockdown, there was no great increase in human noise in the day and comparisons like that. But that's that's an ongoing process on that topic. Then if it's something to the front path, we can does the woman in the proper of the affairs the rot is done. Does that have any issue? Um not that, I the the thing I'd have to say there is earthquakes are intrinsically rare. So yeah. you know, we, the, the there is a point when you're dealing with rare data that you just have to go you can't you can't conclude too much because this happens so really and and sub-annual, you're kind of getting towards issue. Um, tell you what, feel free to, to buttonhole me about this or any of the other weird and wonderful public data projects I've done over the years at other times. But I feel like we're, we're running out of that. I, as I said, the, the key thing really is you can do a lot of good by just counting things up and making it clear to people what, what's going on.